Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome my class. Uh, we'll be in the book of Matthew, uh, where we left off last week in chapter 6. And uh, we'll pick up um, in the middle of Matthew. But before we do, I'd like to pray, not only for my class, but I also know others that, that watch this now. And uh, let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, I pray for those first responders. I pray for the medical people, the EMS, the doctors, the nurses. I pray for my neighbors down the street, Kyle and Carrie, that go every day. And uh, I want to keep them in my thoughts and my prayers as well as the others. As we go through this difficult time in America with this coronavirus, I pray that you don't spend your days in worry and anxiety in fear, but they would rather be spent in hope and encouragement through Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to get your popcorn ready, we're going to pick up on Matthew chapter 6, 16 through 18. 16 through 18, and you'll see it up here on the screen. And in, in uh, verse 16, whenever you fast. Now fasting is a period of time of denial. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just about food. Fasting can be a lot of things that we pull out of our life. But it says, whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do because they want to attract attention to themselves more than the purpose of the fast, which demonstrates self-control, which is the ninth fruit of the Spirit. For they neglect their appearance so that they would be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full, but you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father, who is in secret. I'm going to go back to that word secret in a little bit. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, as we take a look at this, one of the first things I want to tell you is it's not about what you do. It's about why you do it. It's not about what you do. It's about why you do it. So whether you're praying, whether you're fasting, or whether you're giving, it's about how you do it. And we shouldn't be doing things for the wrong motives. Now, I said fasting isn't just about food. It can also be about not watching TV. It can also be about maybe not talking for a period of time. I know sometimes with the young people in this church, instead of not eating because of medications, they'll go for periods of time and not talk, which is back to self-discipline. Or periods of time for no entertainment. And it's all about the self-control. Now, as we take a look at the three things, and I'm going to talk about in secret, the first in Matthew that we talked about was giving. And I just have a note on giving, then, and it's simply this. Greatness is not determined by what you have, but rather by what you give. Second, as we go to prayer, and it's not about us individually, and we've talked about fasting, but I want to pick up on what is called the secret place. And in Matthew 6, verse 4, 6, and 8, it says to pray in secret, to tithe in secret, and to fast in secret. But it's so that you can hear and your Father can hear you or the Holy Spirit. So what do you mean, Tim? I mean this. Imagine there are two people in a room. And one's trying to whisper a secret to the other person. And there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of loud noises. And even though the other person might want to hear, if the room is filled with noises and distractions, even though the message is trying to be communicated, they can't hear. And so it is in our lives where there are too many distractions. There are too many noises. There's too many things going on. So when it says here to pray in secret, to fast in secret, he's talking about shutting everything out and what you do is in secret. Now, as we take a look a little further, let's go to 1 Kings 19, 11, and 12. And this is from the NIV. The other one I read is from the NASB, New American Standard. And the Lord said, 
to Elijah and he said, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then the great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle, small whisper. So all the noisy things were gone. All the disruptive things were gone. But it was in that quiet time that you can hear from, hear from, if you can listen, you will hear from through your spirit. That's the way it is between God's spirit and our spirit. Now, as we begin to talk about spiritual things, we also realize there are flesh things. In other words, when you were born the first time, you were born of flesh. But Adam made mistakes so that we, God came and gave us a second chance through Christ. And we were born a second time through the spirit. Well, someday the flesh will go. But if we simply live in the flesh and are not born again and don't live in the spirit, well, let's turn to Romans 8, 9 through 16, and we'll get an explanation on this. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, through the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Christ made you righteous. He bore your sin on that cross, but made you righteous. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That's the Holy Spirit. He who raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, but to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Last week, we talked about deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. And it was in three pieces of the Bible. Deny yourself, pick up your cross. What he's asking here is to crucify the flesh on a daily basis and live your life spiritually as we move forward in Christ. Now, we're talking about things that you can't see. And I'm going to show you two other scriptures about things that you can't see. If you go to 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things that are, but the things that are not. For the things that are are temporary, and the things that are not are permanent. What are the two permanent things? The word of God and the souls of men. What is a soul? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Two permanent things. So we invest in permanent things even though we can't see it. And we also support that through faith. Now, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it gives you a definition. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, we've all been given a measure of faith. That comes from, from Romans 12.3. I don't have that up on the slide, but that's where you'll find it. Mm -hmm. So... As we look, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let me give you an example of something that's been around since the beginning of time. This substance can knock down buildings. It can raise an airplane. It can give life. It can take away life. It can blow up a tire. What is it? Air. Can you see it? No. Is it real? You better hope so. So we look not at the things that are, but the things that are not. And as we go back to Matthew, I want to give you some more examples. I'm going to turn back to Matthew and finish that section up with Matthew 6, 19 to 24. And it says, do not store up yourselves treasures on earth. In other words, that's what you invest in. Where do you put your time? Where do you put your money? What is important to you? Where are your priorities? That's what you're investing in. Where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourselves treasures where in heaven, where neither moth nor rust will destroy, and where thieves do not break in or steal. 
Now, we mentioned faith and investing in faith. What you invest in or what you have faith in or believe in is what is important to you. And what you believe in is what you support. So, and if, when I speak about faith, also realize this. Go to Matthew 17, 19 to 21. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why can we not drive it out? And he said to them, he was talking about a demon, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, see, it's not how much faith you have, but it's what you have it in. It's not how much faith you have, but it's what you have it in. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to that mountain to move from here to there, and it shall move, and nothing will be impossible for you. And it will move and nothing will be impossible. But this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting as a reference back to the first part that we looked at in the book of Matthew. And as I finish up on 24, if I go to Matthew 6, 24 to finish this section, it, it leads to this. No one can serve two masters and it comes from what are you investing in? So if you're investing in two different directions, you can't serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth, or in some reference points, man mammon. Now, there's a priority to things, and there's an order to things, and there's an order to how you look at things in your Christian life. Let's refer to Matthew 6.33. Then the disciples came, no, mm -hmm. Matthew 6, 33. I don't have that one. It says this, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. So there is an order to things. There is a thing you do first. There is a thing you do second. Here let's, let's, go, let's go here for a minute. I remember when my kids were younger, and they'd get Christmas presents. And sometimes when they had unwrapped that Christmas present, there would be this big box of a picture on the front. It would be like a, a tricycle or a swing set. And then after you opened inside the box, you would see these thousand of parts, several hundred parts, and it had these complicated directions, like 12 pages, and you thought that wonderful picture on the box and about the person that gave it to you, and you want to kill them. But in there, there was an order of things. The first part, the second part, the third part, the fourth part. There's an order to how things work. See, if you've ever gone to a convenience store or some other store and they had a pop machine or a potato chip uh, vending machine and it said out of order, that means it won't work. So there's an order to how your life works. And there's an order to how we do things. And it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Now, in this day and age that we live in, full of anxiety, worry, and fear, it takes me to Matthew 6.25. And just the first several words, it says, for this reason, I say to you, do not worry or be worried. Let me just say this about worry. A lot of people want contentment. You cannot have worry in your life and peace at the same time. That's just a fact. You cannot have worry in your life and peace in your life. So if you have negative thoughts, you'll have a negative life. If you have positive thoughts, you'll have a positive life. Those things just don't go together. But let's go to a situation. It says you cannot have peace and worry at the same time. Example, being positive in a positive situation, that's easy. Anyone can do that. But when you're positive in a negative situation... It shows a genuine trust in God, being positive in a negative situation, when the outcome doesn't look so good. 
Now, in order to explain this, I got to go to one of the fa my favorite characteristics of God. God has a lot of characteristics, but one of the favorite characteristics of God that I admire is the one thing he can't do. And you'll find it in Hebrews 6.18. See, the one thing God can't do, it's impossible for him to lie. Well, how do you know this to be true? How do you know this to be factual? I remember traveling through the Dallas airport, and I'm coming in from Fort Worth, and it was right after 9-11, and I had three boxes and two bags, and I had to get a drop my rental car off, and I had, uh, and I had to take a bus to the B terminal. I had a Southwest flight where I was going from Dallas to El Paso, Texas. And as we pulled up to the terminal, um, the bus driver stopped 150, 200 feet from where I needed to be. And I says, you need to take me down to the ele elevator or, uh, I mean, how do I take these three boxes and two bags and get to El Paso? How do I get on that flight? He says, well, I don't know that, but you can stay on the bus if you want to. Well, I couldn't do that if I was going to go to El Paso, Texas. So I had to step out in difficulty. I had to take the three boxes in the two bags, and he helped me put that on the curb, got back in the bus, took off. So I thought, all right, Lord, how am I going to get to El Paso, Texas? And standing right in front of me was a man, and I remember he had a pork pie hat on, and right behind him was a cart. And I said to that man, is that your cart? And I remember the words. This is what he said. He said, no, somebody left that for you. I put all my stuff on. I was extremely happy. I said, man, I can get down there. I can make my flight. So I turned to thank the man, and there was nobody there. I looked, there was nobody there. I mean, I had just spoken to him seconds ago, and there was nobody there. So I, I took my stuff down. I got on that flight. But I can tell you, all the way to El Paso, Texas, I was puzzled. And my thought was simply this, where did the guy go? Where did he go? And it wasn't until I got to El Paso, Texas, and I sat on the bed at the Holiday Inn that I realized the truth. You see, I was asking, where did the guy go? There was somebody there. And there was somebody there all the time. Because it says in his word, in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. So... Yes, there was somebody there, and he's been there all the time. And he'll be there when you talk in the secret place. He'll be there for prayer. He'll be there for fasting. He'll be there whenever you need him. Thank you for listening to me today. I'll see you next week.